Hello. Thank you for joining us for the Blue Hill Bach 2020 Virtual Festival. I'm Steve Hammer, the Artistic Director of Blue Hill Bach. We hope you've been enjoying our presentation so far. If you've missed some of them, they can be viewed on our YouTube channel or at our website, bluehillbach.org. Now I'm pleased to introduce our virtual preview of The Beggar's Opera, one of the major works we've been planning to present in Blue Hill this summer. We're planning to put on The Beggar's Opera next summer as part of our gala 10th anniversary season. The music director for this project is Grant Herod, who has prepared his own edition of John Gay's original Beggar's Opera from 1728. Today's program of excerpts is performed by members of the Blue Hill Bach Ensemble and brought to you through the magic of the internet. I want to thank Grant, our wonderful musicians, and especially our intrepid video editor and young artist fellow for 2020, Christopher Andaloro, for their dedicated and hard work to make this production possible. We hope you enjoy it. If poverty be a title to poetry, I'm sure nobody can dispute mine. I own myself of the company of beggars and I have a small yearly salary for my catches being welcome to dinner whenever I please, which is more than most poets can say. As we live by the muses, tis but a gratitude in us to encourage poetical merit whenever we find it, particularly during this dreadful plague that has us all imprisoned in our homes. The muses contrary to all other ladies, pay no distinction to dress and never partially mistake the pertness of embroidery for wit, nor the modesty of want for dullness. Be the author who he will, we push his play as far as it will go. This piece I own was originally writ for celebrating the marriage of two most excellent ballad singers. I've introduced the similes that are in all your celebrated operas. And I have a prison scene, which the ladies always reckon charmingly pathetic. As for the parts, I've observed such a nice similarity of the two young ladies in it that it would not be possible for either to take offense. I hope I may be forgiven that I have not made my opera throughout unnatural, like those in vogue. The piece has been frequently represented in our company's room at St. Giles, so I cannot too often acknowledge your charity in bringing it now to the stage. But now I see it is time for us to withdraw. The actors are preparing to begin. Meet Peachum, a receiver of stolen goods, or what we would call a fence. Though self-serving and corrupt, he is a businessman, and he maintains that his illicit trade is no worse than any legal profession. of life, each neighbor opposes his brother, or in rogue they call husband and wife, all professions be rogue one another, the peace calls the lawyer a cheat, the lawyer be knaves the divine, and the statesman because he so great thinks his trade is honest as time, the priest calls the lawyer a cheat, the lawyer be knaves the divine, and the statesman, because he's so great, thinks his trade is honest as mine. Hey.
His wife, Mrs. Peacham, is intimately involved in the family business, as is their daughter Polly. Mrs. Peacham is concerned that her daughter may display the poor judgment of all young ladies that wear the girdle of Venus and fall in love with some rogue that would otherwise prove a useful client. If any wench Venus girdle wear, though she be never so ugly, lilies and roses will quickly appear, and her face look wondrous smugly. Beneath the left ear, so fit but a cord, a rope so charming as own is, the youth in his cart hath the air of a lord, and we cry, there dies an Adonis. Beneath the left ear, so fit but a cord, a rope so charming as own is, the youth in his cart hath the air of a and we cry, there dies an Adonis. The Peachams worry that their daughter Polly is overly affectionate with the highwayman, Captain McKeith. She assures them that she is only toying with him and will not squander her virginity. <laughs> discover that Polly has secretly married McKeith. They are outraged, but Peachum thinks of a solution. Arranged to have the captain accused of crime and executed, and Polly, as his wife, can collect his fortune. But he must make sure no lawyer becomes involved. A fox may steal your head, sir, a whore your health and pence. Sir, your daughter rob your chest, sir. Your wife may steal your rest, sir. A thief your goods and plate. A thief your goods and plate. But this is all but picking with rest, pence, chest, and chicken. It ever was decreed, sir. If lawyer's hand is feed, sir, he steals your whole estate. Polly is horrified by this plan. She goes secretly to McKeith to warn him that he must escape and that she will go with him even to the ends of the earth. And in my arm 
arms and rest my lass Warm amidst the eternal frost To soon the happiest night would pass But Macheath is captured, condemned, and sent to prison to await execution. There he encounters the jailer, Lockett, and his daughter, Lucy, to whom Macheath has also promised marriage. She confesses to her father that Macheath has seduced her. <laughs> But Lockett is unmoved and will not be bribed. He coldly consoles his daughter. turns out is carrying Macheath's child, grieves for his impending death. Oh, 
But, of course, the resourceful McKeith, with Lucy's help, manages to escape. But Peachum and Lockett receive a tip of his whereabouts from one Diana Trapes, an experienced female swindler who's rather tired of it all. Keith is retaken, sent to prison, and awaits his imminent execution with the help of a bottle of brandy. Oh, cruel, cruel, cruel case, must I suffer this disgrace? Of all the friends in time of grave, when threatening death looks grimmer, not one so sure can bring relief as this best friend, a brimmer. Since I must swing, I scorn, I scorn to win or whine. But now again my spirits sink, I'll raise them high with but valor the stronger grows, the stronger liquor we're drinking, and how can we feel our woes? When we've lost the trouble of thinking. If thus a man can die, Much bolder with brandy, So I drink off this bumper, and now I can stand the taste. And my comrades shall say that I die as brave as the best. But 
can I live, my pretty horses, without one tear or tender sigh? Their eyes, their lips, their bosses recall my love a must But, honest friend, I hope you don't intend that McKeith shall be really executed. Most certainly, sir. To make the peace perfect, I was for doing strict poetical justice. McKeith is to be hanged. Why then, friend, this is a downright deep tragedy. The catastrophe is manifestly wrong. For an opera must end happily. Sir, your objection is just and easily removed. For you must allow that in this kind of drama, it's no matter how absurdly things are brought about. So you run, rabble there, and cry reprieve bring the prisoner back to his wives in triumph. Thus I stand like the Turk with his doxies around. From all sides their glances his passion confound. For her black, brown, and fair his inconstancy burns, and the different beauty subdue him by turns. Charms to provoke his desires, though willing to all without one he retires. But think of this maxim and put off your sorrow. The wretch of today may be back tomorrow. Oh, 